Hey, this is JD. And Eli. Introducing the Game Pitch Podcast. A brand new podcast launching on the Project Nerd Network. JD, you want to tell everyone what we're all about? Well, for starters, we're about games. Yeah. And pitches. Yeah. And game pitches? This all makes sense. Every Monday, we're going to cover the week's biggest gaming news. We're going to hand out some industry red cards and pitch a brand new game idea. For our first few weeks, we'll drop new episodes Monday and Thursday to give you a larger sample of the series. I'm Eli. And I'm JD. Let's get to the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Game Pitch Podcast. Uh, my name is JD Osorio. I'm here with my co-host, Elijah. Elijah, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone out there in the wonderful land of gaming. And movies, and TVs, and where all those things intersect, and sports. Indeed, indeed. That's, I mean, that's part of why we're the pitch, right? It is a little bit of both. It's uh, kind of where our worlds meet together. Yeah, well, so I guess that's what we're here to do first. We're here to explain a little bit about who we are and then also about what this podcast is about. So first and foremost, like our name implies, Game Pitch. We're about games, right? Yeah, I mean, so we both grew up in video games. I feel like pretty much everyone around us has. And we love games. We love making games. We love talking about games. We obviously love playing games. And so I think that is first and foremost the, the big piece about it. So, you know, JD, I was going to ask you, because I, I felt this way for a long time, that gaming is the most important art form to me, because like there's TV, there's movies, there's artwork, you know, artwork, it's, it hangs on a wall and a movie you get like talked at for like two and a half hours. And then a show you can binge at your own pace, watch it, you know, one episode a night or watch 20. But I just I, I think games are I, my and this is maybe because it's the generation I grew up in, but I think they're my favorite form of artwork or of like storytelling. Yeah, I think, and I think storytelling right there at the end is the important piece, right? I think games are interactive fiction. And so that helps us bridge the gap of, you know, picking up and reading a good book, which obviously is amazing still. And I still love to do that and imagining yourself in that story. And I think games takes that to a whole other level where you truly are the embodiment of the character in that story. And you get to play as them and make those choices and kind of run with it the way you want. And so I think, yeah, I agree. I it, it's hard for me to imagine growing up without video games at this point. Yeah, well, and so a little bit about, you know, who we are, me me specifically, uh, audience. Again, I'm Elijah. You can call me Eli or whatever. But uh, in the same way that uh, people get excited for the Oscars and they wear suits and things like that, and they, you know, plan their entire lives around watching all the Oscar contenders and, like, having their polls and, like, making their selections. I feel the same way about E3. Like I take that week off of work, or at least I try and plan my days off to uh, coincide with the big conferences. So like Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft. Yeah. I mean, I remember growing up, we would literally request those weeks off work when we worked together and we would cram into my house and we'll just get around my TV and try to find a good quality stream and put it up on the TV. <laughs> and it was just like a bunch of dudes crammed into this little bedroom and it was probably not the best smell in that room yeah but no. <laughs> but it was amazing because it was just all of us riffing off each other's excitement for oh my gosh like what is microsoft about to announce oh man like here comes something big from nintendo oh my like it was every single show we were just amped on it we were just on this constant high for like three or four days straight yeah, uh, one of our uh, mutual pals, Tyler, when they re when they announced that uh, Kingdom, or, sorry, not Kingdom Hearts, uh, Final Fantasy VII remake, like that dude, like ran oh, around yeah. the room screaming. <laughs> like when well, I'll never forget the chills that I got when they first announced Halo Three, and you get that oh. first bum bum bum, oh, I know. bum bum, and you just see Chief and like everything flying in, and it's just oh. like, yeah, I'm never gonna forget that moment the rest of my life. So I think you know, telling people who we are, we're two people who love games, and of course we like movies and books and comics and all these other things, and we, we TV, do a lot. We're, yeah, we're, we're in a golden yeah, age of TV yeah yeah so much good stuff but i think for me foundationally games is the thing that built me i was alone with them a lot as a kid as an only child and like i just i learned how to read because of video games because i wanted to know what was going on in a final fantasy game so yeah games games is everything to me yeah i mean and i same same here i mean i i you know no argument there i grew up since i was a little kid playing on my nes and just cramming in as much time as i could i remember uh growing up we had a little pc and we put the sims on it and my brother and i would take turns playing <laughs> the sims like on a summer day it'd be like i get an hour then he gets an hour and then i get an hour, and like we just go back and forth on this pc for like eight hours just like running our sims and you know deleting the ladder in the pool and uh all the fun things you do with the sims so oh oh yeah no no trying to convince my mom to upgrade the ram and our, our, our you know our family computer just so i could play runescape better absolutely like, <laughs> it's terrible oh no it's it's yeah yeah i feel that i absolutely get that 
<laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so uh, another uh, cool thing about I think the both of us is that we uh, we are both writers uh, for Project Nerd. Yeah, so Elijah's been doing it a little longer than I have, but uh, we like to cover pretty much everything from you know games and the gaming industry. Uh, Elijah writes a lot of excellent pieces for his originals uh, called Pros and Cons, where he gets to break down movies and TV shows and uh, things in games or uh, DLCs in games where he it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the pros and the cons of that content. I just uh, did uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Uh, I saw that just went up. Yeah. And yep. uh, what was exciting about that is that like it's the first time I've ever been in the room with the director when I saw a movie for the first time. So uh, oh, Kevin that's Smith cool. was there. He did a Q&A. So it like made me like the movie more because I like him, which is maybe unfair. Like I wish like a certain game designers like <laughs> Cliffy B could be in the room with me, like explaining this is why Fortnite should have only been like waves of enemies and not building. Rah. Like, I'm just like Cliffy, chill. <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. No, I uh, I don't know if you follow Cliffy B on Twitter, but I yes. absolutely always love the constant trolling of any maybe pseudo controversial opinion somebody else has, and then he goes in and just takes it to an entirely new level, and it really makes my Twitter experience that much better. Yes, that is a man who amps things up. For, for instance, when you had uh, oh, yeah. like some kind of machine gun adding a chainsaw to it, he's amping it up. Yeah, he just took it to a new plane that no one had thought of before. And maybe it didn't need to go there, but I am happy it did. <laughs> yeah, I, I am very happy that they exist. Do <laughs> uh, you think we should uh, start talking about the news this week? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the news. Uh, do you want to lead us in? Yeah, so this is our scouting report, the amazing things that happened uh, this week. So people really like Sonic, which is people interesting. People really like Sonic. My um, review for that goes live tomorrow. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that's perfect. I uh, have not seen it yet. Um, I'm actually quite behind on movies just because of how many games I'm still trying to catch up on and TV. But uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I've i seen so much, you know, coming out the same time as Birds of Prey. And, you know, you feel like Birds of Prey did pretty good. And then Sonic comes out and just absolutely blows it out of the water, becoming the fastest grossing video game movie. It's beating Detective Pikachu right now, which, which I thought crazy. was crazy. I love that movie. So <laughs> I love that no, movie too. It makes no sense. I, I well, it also I can't fathom how Sonic could be bigger than Pokemon. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense, right? Well, okay, well, and then so like, what's the percentage bump that Sonic got from Detective Pikachu being good? Like, is there a hey, this video game movie's <laughs> okay? Maybe we'll give this other one a shot. Is there, is there anything there? I don't know if there's like a cumulative opinion that helps one movie do better than others, because if that was true, then you feel like somewhere along the way, Wonder Woman doing so well would have helped some of DC's other comic movies, which have absolutely not done well. So somewhere, if that informed better success down the chain maybe but i don't know if that's uh i don't know if that's helping here yeah, so i just i can't figure it out i don't know if they marketed it right if it just came out in a in a window where there's no other kids movies or just this is the deadpool slot so deadpool did really well in this february uh slot and then now i guess sonic's just killing it and it just doesn't make sense to me maybe um sure. detective pikachu had uh more competition because it came out with marvel movies surrounding it and then you know in that may time slot with other movies uh leading into the summer but man i just sonic's good i don't know it is. if it's best movie game of all time <laughs> good like it's it's a kid's movie <laughs> and there's another aspect here right like everything i've read online again i haven't seen it but everything i've read online says it's good and i think if you think back to when they originally debuted the character design and the internet absolutely exploded and then they decided to redo it which is like unheard of like are you kidding me there's they're actually going to take this massive criticism and and fix it like it's amazing yeah and so i wonder if some of that has rubbed off a bit where the community as a whole sees this and they're like okay this is amazing like they took our time like they took our feedback and they wanted to make this better like maybe we should then turn around and give back because what message does it mm. send if the internet rages and then they don't support it and then they don't support it right like hey we want this fixed okay we'll fix it we're not gonna go watch your movie then it's like uh like well we'll never do this again <laughs> again like, yeah, yeah. Well, then, so so that just to kind of let uh give you more uh like ammunition in that uh that argument there like there was a healthy mix of parents that were there with kids and 30 year old dudes that were wearing sonic shirts i can Perfect. tell you that it was it was like 60 40 the mix and there was a, a gamer stench in the room i was like oh, oh yes ah oh, yes it takes me back to my magic the gathering days like perfect well, <laughs> it was thick 
Yeah, well, that is not the word I like to hear. Uh, <laughs> thick is a terrible word to describe the atmosphere of a movie theater. Um, thick musk filled with 30-year-old men. Is that worse than saying that the taste in the air was palpable? I don't know. Um <laughs> Let's, uh, so Sonic did good. Uh, and so yeah. rolling right into that, uh, Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 comes out May 7th. And uh, there's a notable omission. Yeah, my guy Mario, the plumber. Where's Mario? In in his homeland. Like, how would they omit Mario in his homeland of Tokyo? What What's happening here? Well, first of all, if he is indeed a plumber and we are to think he's Italian, we can just safely say that maybe in this world, Italy did not qualify for the Olympics. I don't know. <laughs> Were they relegated out? I, I don't know. There's uh, <laughs> there's something here that we are not getting the whole story of. But see, it's like everyone from the Mushroom Kingdom got the boot. So like Bowser, he's definitely not from Italy. So like he could have qualified somewhere else. Toad, the same. I just it just seems strange. We don't know for sure that Toad and Bowser are not Italian, right? <laughs> You're right. Is there lore that explicitly tells us that they are from a different country? So I like your head headcanon where it's just like <laughs> the Mushroom Kingdom, just like the, the Italian job or the Italian story, like all it's, of them. Mushroom Kingdom is train adjacent to Sicily is basically what I think we're getting at here. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, ghost this story here to go to another ghost story, and uh, it's StarCraft Ghost. Uh, do you remember this game, GameCube days? Like, did you ever see trailers or? I so I was reading this headline when you sent it, and uh, for some reason I cannot picture it. So fill fill me in. So it was like a stealth game where you played as one of the ghost troopers, which is just like the snipers that can go invisible um, from StarCraft, uh, StarCraft 1, StarCraft sure. 2. Okay. Yep. And Kerrigan, um, one of the main characters, I believe right. you were supposed to play this game as her, but it was a third person, like almost what they did with Metroid Other M, like uh, like a, a Zelda style third person shooter type game. Oh, it was, like, interesting. There are plenty of demos. There, were, there was like gameplay reveals that they showed and then it just got canned. It's one of those things that just Blizzard just like was like, nope, not up to our standards. It's gone. Interesting. Then, um, yeah. So this is some Xbox footage that went up, just more mm. playable chunks of the game. And I was just excited. And I was just like, why didn't they why didn't they do this? I wonder if now, you know, seeing seeing some of this footage come up and maybe there's, you know, I, I don't know if Activision Blizzard is necessarily in the best spot in terms of their audience really loving what they're doing right i think right. there's been a pretty decent amount of frustration with how they've treated the diablo franchise um you see like diablo immortals and i don't know if anyone like is really happy about that and that they use blizzcon stage time to talk about that and so now you have to wonder like are they going to start exploring these other ways where like how do they win some of this favor back how do they get some of this blizzard love re-injected um and and you know not to totally divert here but i think one of the ways they do that is they got rod ferguson to take over the diablo series and i think that is an amazing appointment i think he's gonna do a lot of good for that franchise uh so as long as they let him go in and, and do it his way right i think he yeah. is really good about getting projects finished and I hope that's not the case here. I hope he's not going in to just get a project that's underway across the finish line. I hope he gets to kind of go in and inject some of his creative DNA into it. Um, so speaking of his creative DNA, for the please. gamers out there who might not know Ferguson, who is he? What is his resume? Yeah, uh, so Rod Ferguson uh, has basically been in charge of Gears of War for yep. a very, very long time. So back to uh, when Cliffy B had the reins and it was Epic Games. Uh Ferguson worked pretty closely with with Cliffy B. He left. Uh, he went and worked on um, a couple other games, and then Epic Came spun back off to the, the Coalition. Yeah. Right? The Coalition is what it's called. Yeah. So before it was the Coalition, it was Black Tusk Studios. Yes. And so I Black that. Tusk uh, was acquired by Microsoft, and really their only IP they were working on was Gears. And so they respun the the branding of that studio to the Coalition, and in in doing that, it, it effectively was, this is a Gears of War studio. If you're here, we're working on Gears of War. And yep. Ferguson has led that charge since, um, putting out multiple Gears titles and, and you know, Pop Gears and Gears Tactics and a lot of other stuff that we haven't even seen yet. So 
yeah, I mean, he's got a pretty impressive resume, not only at his time with Microsoft in a first party studio, but also, you know, externally when he was with Epic and uh, yeah, just some of the other stuff he worked on is pretty impressive too. Yeah, and well, and it's a huge loss, I think, for the coalition specifically and for Microsoft that says something interesting as well to me. Yeah, I think it really, it'll be curious to see what sort of a succession plan they have set up there um, because I think Gears is finally getting into this really sweet spot again. At a certain point, it kind of got really stale and it was, uh, you yeah. know, like, is this is this a franchise that has the legs to go a long time? And so- I think, I think it was trying to like compete with Call of Duty and go sure. broad, which, is, yeah. was, which was a mistake. And these more recent entries have definitely been going more niche and like getting into more what Gears is about, I think. Oh yeah. Like just leaning into their curve. So I think that that's the smart move, but just kind of bringing it back just around to everything. Um, it, it's interesting because you brought up, you know, Activision, um, Blizzard not really, or Blizzard really not being in such high esteem anymore. And that's, I think, as soon as they got married to Blizzard, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. when your friend is dating that girl that you're just like, oh gosh, <laughs> why is this happening? So it's like, that's, I feel bad for Blizzard, but it's kind of happening, happening all over the games industry. And I think it's, you know, when it comes to stock or making money or monetizing or microtransactioning your games, because they just had the, uh, the co-lead of Take Two for the Red Dead uh, studio. He just left too, the brother, the writer. What was his name? Yeah, I saw that. Um, what was it? I can't recall off the top of my head, but it wasn't just Red Dead. He was a uh, creative director of Rockstar, not Take yeah. Two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so it's a considerably an even bigger loss, right? Because it's not just a Red Dead thing, but it impacts potentially the future of the Grand Theft Auto series. He was the lead writer for Grand Theft Auto V, which is one of the absolute, if not the absolute, best-selling game ever, right? Yeah. I mean, it's... Oh, yeah. it's as in in terms of like a single title, not as like a, a franchise, but um, so yeah, it's massive. It's a huge loss for for Rockstar. So 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 many of these companies are losing their their big creative people, and I wonder if that's a product of their asking too much money now or they think that they've already got there the ip's established so why pay the you know why pay the or keep squeezing the golden goose when you've already sure. got the eggs yeah sure so, yeah it's just and, and this happens all over the game industry and that's maybe one of the things why starcraft ghost never made it off the ground because they were spending triple a money on something that wasn't going to make them microtransaction money and, and you know we talk about activision blizzard right now i think you know, something else that's been floating around, and I and I know you've seen this too, is that there's all sorts of speculation that they're going to start remaking other uh, franchises, right? So mm -hmm. Tony Hawk and Crash Games and, and other Blizzard franchises that we haven't necessarily seen in a while. Maybe not remaking, but maybe kind of reinventing some of those or remastering yeah, like old ones. How they did with Crash and Spyro and uh, yep. Crash Team Racing. They had all that success there. So there was even, um, what is it called? Um meeting uh, what, what is the, the um, investor meeting yeah one of the yep. investor calls where they had essentially they said that they're going to try those other experiences from their catalogs those remasters and those collections like that and um i'd speculate that tony hawk would be a good one to do but i mean could you remaster call of duty one through three and just put them on a disc and people buy that or is this like you do diablo one and two or you do starcraft one and two i don't know what the answer is but they said that they're going to go back into their catalog and i was like what is activision's catalog it's hard not to want to lean into that nostalgia side of mm -hmm. things because I think it's shown that it's doing pretty well, right? Yeah. It's it's pretty popular and people will play for nostalgia. Like look at Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, right? It, True. It's, it's Pokemon Yellow, right? It's a super old Pokemon game that sold tons of copies. Like my Switch that I play on daily is the Pokemon Let's Go Eevee version. Like that's how hyped I was for that game. And like <laughs> and it's it's a game I've played so many times. Like it's not a new it wasn't Shield or Sword, right? Like it was Pokemon Yellow that I played yeah. before and I like was throwing my money at GameStop to give me a Pokemon Let's Go Eevee console like the nostalgia sells it's real yeah. man okay, like <laughs> i know okay did you buy the pokeball to get mew absolutely of course yeah. i did because <laughs> that's where i drew the line i told them no 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 themselves. i was like i was like no you will not because like you know the game shark days where it was just like oh, oh he's hidden under a truck i was like no you will yep. not make me buy a pokeball <laughs> oh no yeah that was an easy purchase as far as i'm concerned um <laughs> that was that was no problem at all
So I think the other side of this coin, so so we were kind of talking about how they're microtransactioning things or they're they're kind of pivoting to games that can maybe make them more money, mining their old catalogs and stuff like that. I think surprisingly, EA is on the opposite side of the coin right now when it comes to Jedi Fallen Order. And oh, I yeah. don't know if that's a thing that's really if just because the audience spoke so loudly and purchased the game and it on their um, earnings call, they basically said that Jedi Fallen Order is exceeding all expectations. It's already sold through like seven to eight million copies and they expect it to do more than 10 by the end of the fiscal year. And maybe that's gamers saying loudly to EA, one, give us Star Wars games and we'll buy them. Like yes. if you like it, it, it can be a seven and we're going to be happy. Like as long <laughs> as it's Star Wars. And also hopefully this like makes EA think, oh man, we can make single player experiences yes. or triple A story games and get money too. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, you, you nailed it, right? So, so it's, it's two things. One, Star Wars obviously sort of feeds into that nostalgia piece. Um, cause it's, it's Star Wars. Like yeah. we all yeah. grew up with it. Right. Yeah. But, and I'm not done with Jedi Fallen Order. Um, I still have more to play in it. Um, it's just part of that catalog of games I'm trying to work through, but what I've played so far is incredible. And it speaks to EA to give respawn the chance to make that game and uh respawn like knocked it out of the park man like they absolutely crushed it and yeah, well, and a surprise uh, from a F- fps studio with sure uh, the vince's pedigree with call of duty and then titanfall because i love titanfall i think titanfall 2 is really underrated the story i think is amazing and i just i just didn't see this from them it was um, an um, it's an amazing game so far and i'm super excited to to finish it up and i think you're spot on that it kind of awakens and I think Sony has been doing this. And so it gives some of these other developers and publishers a little more comfort in, in following that path. But Sony has been leaning super hard into these single player, extremely story driven games, right? That's, Mm -hmm. that's the pedigree right now of the end, end of cycle PlayStation four and early cycle. Right. Um, and I think it's also what they're going to lean heavily into for PS5. They're saying these single player, you know, this this is this is our thing. And so I think them doing so extremely well is showing studios like EA where it's like, okay, like they're they're killing it. Like, what can yeah. we do to to really make this work? And um, you know, it's funny. Um, you were talking about uh the you know, Respawn being a primarily FPS studio. I don't know if you heard. um, So on IGN's podcast, IGN Unfiltered, they had Stig Stig on, who is the, uh, basically the director of Respawn. Uh, He was the director of Jedi Fallen Order. And he told this really amazing story uh, that was basically when they were pitching, uh, they were at Lucas Ranch, uh, Skywalker Ranch, right? And they are kind of going back and forth. And they're telling them like, this is, this is our idea, right? Like it's going to be kind of like samurai, Jedi, blah, blah, blah. And (laughs) and they, they're like, um, like, well, you know, why don't you, you know, like make something with like shooting like with stormtroopers, Right. And they're like, basically like, no, like there's no way we're going to let you make a game about Jedi. Like there's no way. And so like throughout this course of pitching and refining, they came to learn like, Jedi are like super sacred to the way that they perceive like in in any sort of development medium it's like the crown jewel and it's like hey if you're going to make something with Jedi like it is going to be so extremely locked down to our our specifications (laughs) and so like they tell these stories where it's like we had to absolutely prove ourselves and prove to them like we can make a Jedi game and so like they finally get there right best part of the story is they finally get there And uh, they're like, okay, cool. Like, this game's great, whatever. Like, you can't say that it's a Jedi, though. And then they ship the game and call it Jedi Fallen Order. (laughs) And they're like, like, well, hopefully that doesn't come back to bite us in the ass. And uh, I think then the game doing as well as it did is sort of like that affirmation of, like, they knew from the beginning what they wanted to make, and they did it, and they stuck to their guns. And I think that is so, so awesome. 
No, dude, I love that. The thing that you that you made me think of is it's like that's like one of your buddies trying to date your sister, and like they <laughs> really, really gotta like have a good. Oh pitch. yeah. Like, oh yeah. Like you have to. Yeah have to so uh okay so uh last little thing just kind of building off more star wars love here and the uh, activision talking about dipping back into their catalog ea is looking to be doing the same thing there's heavy rumors out there that kotor is getting remastered please but, yeah not necessarily um just just a regular remastering that it could possibly combine the stories of the first two please. games into one game perfect and it also could change some things to canonize it or have this be the relaunch of a new like the new um high republic era that they might be doing for the movies and have the movies and the games tie into each other so there's a lot of like crazy balls in the air with this but man that would be cool yeah i'm all for that please um i will give you money um yeah (laughs) i'll give you lots of money uh i define my friends like star wars fandom by like how much they love hk47 and if i'm like hk47 they're like oh i don't know who that is then i'm like then you're not a real star wars fan my guy get out (laughs) get out (laughs) <laughs> all right cool that's the end of our scouting report for our, uh, our regular news here but uh, we do have some some quick little some some fastballs to throw at you yeah go ahead start it off uh they added the rick roll to Fortnite. yeah i mean yes of course they did why why wouldn't they do that um <laughs> uh, epic gets it they absolutely get it they are tied into culture in a way that i don't know many other studios are and i love it so yeah that's perfect um next one castlevania season three comes out march 5th yeah did you have you seen the first two seasons nope because i think this is the best video game thing okay it's been adapted anywhere it's amazing so watch it is what you're saying yes but uh what you don't have to watch now is the cutscenes in borderlands 3 because they just added the skip feature Oh, so they've caught up. It is uh, 2020, and this is a uh, big a big moment for everyone at Gearbox. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm really happy. <laughs> uh, another thing that's making me extremely happy right now is Pokemon Home is finally out. Um, I've kicked around with it a little bit on my Switch and on my phone. Um, I got the free Pikachu. I made some transfers. I got a free uh, Bulbasaur, which is amazing. I would have got a Char- uh, Charmander, who easily best pokemon uh but i already have a uh, shiny charizard so no problem okay see here's okay you said a lot of things there that i that i take umbrage with but <laughs> it's okay <laughs> i'm just gonna let my little my little froggy cabbage boy i'm gonna put him aside for a moment and i like i'm just mad that like sword and shield they thought that they could just let you play through the mm-hmm. whole game without bulbasaur or charmander or squirtle i get it it's a new gen but like you just gotta give me those three pokemon all the time Okay, I'll move on. I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> this could be a whole episode. Go, right, go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, are you? Do you have any interest in that Kingdom Hearts Super Mega Collection? So it's like all of it. It's called the All in One Collection. I have an interest because I I think it's nice that they're going to launch something with with all of the content that's come out over the last good lord over ten years, right? Um, I have an interest that I think it's cool. I don't have a fiscal yes, interest in yes. buying one, so. <laughs> Yes, good, good. Because here's my thing. Like, you know how everyone's mad about Mass Effect 3 ending? Like, Absolutely. I feel that way about Kingdom Hearts times 10, especially Perfect. after investing into all of the 10 games and all of the plot holes. <laughs> and just like, I feel even more hurt. Okay, let's move on. Uh, please, uh, go go ahead. <laughs> okay, so uh, have you seen that GameCube, uh, Doc? Oh, yeah, I have uh, for the Switch where it's like the the Joy-Cons are actually like the Joy-Cons that mimic the GameCube controller, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like it looks like it's a hollowed out GameCube that you put your Switch into and then you can Love actually it. plug old school GameCube controllers in it into it and it works like that's amazing. that's nuts. That's amazing. Um, God, Switch is such a cool console it's and the best. And and speaking of right. So earlier I told you I have the Pokemon Let's Go uh, Switch, which yes. Like, apparently, I just have a theme for themed switches because the absolute second I found out about the Animal Crossing switch, um, I fell in love. I was waiting for pre-orders to go live, got caught in a work thing, and completely missed them. So GameStop is sold out. Best Buy is sold out. I can't get one anywhere. Amazon shows that they're not available. I'm sad. I'm scrolling on Twitter, and uh, Polygon posted a little thing that was like, hey, they're in stock on Amazon. There's no way this is true. I go on to Amazon. Sure enough, they're in stock. 
And so I'm getting another switch that I absolutely don't need, but uh, how could I not get it? And then I found out it doesn't even come with the game, which I'm not mad about because I'm just going to buy the game anyway. So. <laughs> My God, that's incredible! Uh, I was gonna say that it's just like the color scheme is so hot. It's so those it's Joy Cons beautiful. are so. Oh my God! If they sold those Joy Cons separately, which is the reason they don't, I would just go buy those Joy Cons. I don't need another Switch. I just want those Joy Cons. Yep. The the dock is great too, with Tom Nook and the little Nooklings on the island. It's beautiful. It's white. It's it's such a pretty looking piece of hardware. I think um, that case, ugh. the one that's like the uh, the white with the green leaves on it and stuff, and the teal. I think that was a Target exclusive. Oh, of course. Excellent. Great. I I just. Like we're playing checkers and Nintendo's out here playing chess, man. Just like who would be like forty you know, chess? We we got to have those uh, target exclusives for the, yeah. the freaking, just Jesus. I, I love yeah, it. no, I mean that's this is this is it. This is the this is the game now. Ah uh, man, I can't wait for that. We're gonna there's gonna be a lot of Animal Crossing coverage on this podcast. I suspect it will be- actually just become an Animal Crossing podcast. I feel yeah. like <laughs> welcome to Animal Pitch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm Tom Nook. <laughs> Here's my homie Rossetti. And I'm a nookling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um the podcast, it's called Game Pitch. And every week we're going to endeavor to pitch you a game. And this could be a new game born of our own brains. It could be just uh the smallest nugget of an idea. It can be maybe something that even you guys uh tell us should be a game. But I'm gonna start this week and uh I'm gonna give you because Mass Effect is near and dear to my heart. I'm gonna give you the a uh, pitch on what I think the um the bad guys should be for the next uh mass effect oh okay i like this so this is not a game pitch per se it is a pitch of a new character archetype in an existing universe is that kind of the idea here no I, you know i think I, this is just i need like to hear the, it i need to yeah. hear it okay yeah this is i think this is the way that this should be the next overarching three game like the reapers were the first part this is the next like the big bad i think and it's going to kind of pivot the gameplay as well so uh, in star wars uh there is star killer base yep. and i was uh, pretty offended by that movie uh force awakens <laughs> even though i love that movie um that the star killer base didn't kill any stars it killed sure. planets which seems sure. dumb which made me think of oh man what if there was an alien race that did fly around mm-hmm. in ships and siphon off the energy from stars and they were the star killers um, yeah. i thought it'd be really cool because i love dead space and I love Mass Effect. So what if Mass Effect had a little bit more of a horror element? Because when this alien group comes into a certain system and you do missions in that area, while there's still sun, there's still light on some of the planets. But once they've killed the sun, uh, those levels become completely in darkness. And okay, because okay. The, the the level of space that they're at or like technology, you could probably still survive on certain planets without um, sunlight because you would have artificial environments and food makers or whatever sure. Star Trek nonsense happens. But I think that would really change the gameplay up having to play in darkness and maybe having your powers light up areas. And I just thought like, how could I make a horror mass effect game? And to me, this was the only way to maybe get there. Yeah, I like it. I, um, yeah, no, I think that's super smart. Um, so one thing though, I have to go back, uh, because it's star Wars and I will always sort of, uh, defend it just to my dying breath for the most part uh star killer base while it didn't kill stars it did draw energy from stuns which are stars which it then in turn killed right so uh it should have been star sucker base okay it was like yeah, you try you're jj abrams and you pitch star sucker base to disney and you tell me how that goes <laughs> You're right. You're right. Okay. So, I, and I, and I do not want any merchandise that's Star Sucker base. I don't want a Star Sucker pin or a t-shirt, all right? Star Killer just sounds so much cooler. Um You're right. You're right. You're right. I'm wrong. Back, back to the pitch. I love it. Um I think after Andromeda there needs to be some pretty dramatic shifts to how we play those games and a horror mass effect uh, one i hate horror games but i love the idea so that sounds like something that i would be too scared to play which means it probably is a good idea um <laughs> <laughs> so i mean yeah kudos there because uh I, I think that's almost the measurement of like if you have this really scary like suspenseful thing like i, I don't want to play that and that's not because it's bad it's just because i know it will scare me and if it 
if it's a game that's going to scare me like that, it's pretty well done. So, uh, well done. <laughs> Look, I'm just, I don't know if 30% or 40% of my pitches are going to be based around Mass Effect, but Perfect. they might. I just want you to know this. I just uh, want a good Mass Effect game. It's all I want, JD. If anyone from BioWare is listening, uh, Elege has a lot of ideas. So please, uh, <laughs> please let him talk to you so we can have some different pitches on this podcast. <laughs> what if it's all, so, JD, what if it's all stoned aliens and it's just called Grass Effect? Look, I mean, that actually, again, better than Andromeda. So, yes, <laughs> it's it's green lit as far as I'm concerned. It's green lit. Oh, you, I see what yeah, you did there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to hand you a red card for that, but <laughs> we're going to hand out a red card this week. I think we should. Um, so, red card... Uh, listeners so you all know it's kind of a segment that we're gonna approach something in the industries you know movies games tvs some comics right something that we think has to go um something that we don't like or the perception was bad and we think it it doesn't do any good for for the medium for the industry and so that's kind of the idea behind this segment is we saw something and together we collectively are like hey that's that's the wrong way to do this. Um, and so this week we're talking about, uh, so l- let me back up. So this week there was a couple talks, right, uh, around PAX and Tim Sweeney, uh, CEO, President of Epic Games, uh, has been quoted all over the place, uh, effectively boiling down to politics need to get out of games, right? That's the that's the headline you'll yeah. see. That's the the pull quote on tweets and on articles and all this stuff, right? And uh, Elijah, you you have a term, right? You have a terminology for for effectively what people are doing, right? So what what is it? Yeah, well, I, one, I think that this is like low class, uncouth, and just get this all the way out of here, red card. But they're headline hunting, and it's right, just right. to generate clicks. And I just when this happens so much just across all media so it's not just a games industry problem but when the actual story is very different than what the headline says because the headline sure. is going to just get them to go there and it, it i mean even when a, a company or a a entity as uh powerful and as important to gaming as ign can do this can post that same kind of headline and everyone clicks on it it's like you're almost inviting the outrage before the people have even read and i know it's so yeah. hard to convince people to read things these days because they just it is. Like, get that gratification, but absolutely, uh, it it hurts. Like, it hurts my heart because I care about games. Sure, and I think it's it's really it, you know. And there's so much stupid stuff around Epic because of Epic Game Store, and like people will find things to rip, like Fortnite bad, right? Like people find all these dumb things to try to like rip on Epic, which is so foolish and. And this is just another instance of that, right? Is like, oh, cool. Like now Epic CEO is saying these controversial things. Like let's, let's rip on Epic some more. And I think that's super unwarranted. Like Fortnite is massive for a reason. Like it's obviously killing it for a reason. Uh, Epic game store, I think is much, much, much needed competition to steam. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if they have the money to go buy exclusives, like cool. Like I don't understand why people are so, hell bent on supporting a platform like people are like i'll never buy a game off epic game store like i'm only gonna buy off steam and it's like sure maybe there's some technical reasons like they don't have a linux support for a game or whatever right but like at the end of the day it's just this foolish stance to take on something and i don't get it and so it, the it, these little issues all boil up to cool like now tim sweeney has said something and there's this tiny pull quote that I'm going to take and run with, and I'm going to base my whole story around this and I'm going to share this on Twitter. And that's what gets shared around on Twitter. And there's a ton of other people on Twitter also that like jumped to his defense, like Rami Ismail, like uh, he's one of, he's half of Vlambeer, right? He was super quick to be like, Hey, here's like the actual full article. And like, yes, this is said, but also like this is being horribly spun out of context. Like there's like, he's a thoughtful person. There's nuance there. And all you're doing is you're like, I I feel and not to specifically call it IGM. And of course, many media outlets did this Kotaku did this, but I feel like they invited the trolls to like assault him. Like they could, they they could have generated the death threats or the the trolling. And then just like made this person's life more difficult for no reason. And of course he's getting paid hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So like, of course, like, like I'm not trying to like 
boohoo on the, the the rich people but like i feel i just i just think it sucks for him just in general it's like wait what read the article yeah i agree i think it's it's just a you know your 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 thing of saying it's headlight hunting right it's click baiting it's a bad practice and so that's uh that's what we're giving our red card to this week is yeah. uh headline hunting click baiting it's bad it's not good for informing a public it's it's just poor form it honestly is really all it is can I throw out throw out one more quick little red card that you made me realize in that? I do. Yeah, I want to hear it. Uh, everyone who's so loyal to Steam because like mm, you're mm. you're the, you're the reason that I did not get Half Life Episode Three. I blame <laughs> you because they realized oh we don't need to make games we could just have them <laughs> like on well, our service. Yeah, like we can just sell games and take thirty percent and like Steam's great and I use Steam all the time and I buy games on Steam and I use Steam Friendless and all that stuff right. And at the same time, I look at it from the lens of, you know, when I'm making games and I want to sell and distribute games, like why in the hell should I give 30% to, to Steam and to, to, to Valve, right? Why would I do that when I can turn around and give a smaller percentage to Epic or there's other platforms to distribute to that maybe don't give me as much traffic, but I'll keep more of the money from a development point of view. Um, and so it's this real tight balance of, you know, do you want to be seen? And if you want to be seen, it's like the the double edged sword is cool. You have to you have to distribute on Steam, right? And even yeah. then, there's no guarantee of it. Maybe if they do like this indie spotlight or something, but it's uh it's tough. It's really tricky. I, I don't I didn't know that we were going to do double uh, red cards, but I, you know, <laughs> it doesn't happen often. But uh, <laughs> look, that's what that's that's how it goes sometimes. You know, you yeah, that's how it goes. So. We have we have approached the end. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for jumping on, listening to our first of hopefully many. Uh, apologize if there's any weird kinks. You know, please tell us. Um, tell us your um, kinks. Tell us your kinks. We want to hear them. <laughs> we, uh, it, you know, this is a spinoff of our other uh, our other podcast, which is Kink Cast, uh, yeah, Kink which. Cast. <laughs> And so, please, we want to know them. Uh, we won't talk about them on this podcast, but we uh, we'll save them for later. We're gonna save them for the kink cast, and we're definitely gonna text about them privately. So, yeah, a hundred percent. All right. So, uh, again, I am Eli. You can find me at that guy Eli on Instagram. There's some underscores in there. It's like that guy and then underscore and then Eli. And, I don't uh, know. Yeah. So, and then also, uh, I wrote about Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Uh, you can find that at ProjectNerd.com, and then also Sonic Review will be up tomorrow. Or when yeah. you hear this, it'll probably already be up. And again, I'm JD. Uh, I'm on Twitter at J to the D. That's J A Y, the number two, the D E E. Uh, I also write for Project Nerd. And if you're typing Project Nerd into your browser, it's project nerd.com. If you just go regular Project Nerd, I don't know where you'll end up. And I'm absolutely not responsible for that. So uh, <laughs> don't tell, don't uh, say I didn't warn you. Yeah. Oh, man, you could find our, our tags, our information, the website, all that in the show notes uh, below in the description and all that. But uh, other than that, thank you for listening to the Game Pitch. Thanks for listening to Game Pitch. If you like it, please uh, subscribe. Leave us a review. If you don't like it, still leave us a review and tell us why, because we want to get better and we want to make this show better. So thanks again for listening and uh, talk to you guys next week. Bye.